ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Welcome to the Daily Wire backstage, sponsored tonight by Jeremy's Razor. Stop giving your money to woke corporations that hate you. Give your money to me instead. We've got a big Jeremy's Racers announcement actually coming up a little bit later in the show. But first, we're going to talk about some politics. Joining me to do just that, uh, the gateway to the extreme right, himself, Ben Shapiro. Five days a week, Candace Owens. Now with even more Candace Owens. Candace Owens. <laughs> the extreme right, Matt Walsh. <laughs> Andrew Clavin's biggest fan, Michael Knowles. And the ghost of Andrew Clavin, Andrew Clavin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, of course, am your lowercase God King Jeremy Boring. Uh, not only do we have this great announcement coming up about Jeremy's Razors after the show, uh, but we also have all kinds of fun things to tell you about that are going on at the Daily Wire. And one of the biggest things that's going on at the Daily Wire right now is that Matt Walsh is literally destroying Vanderbilt <laughs> Hospital right here in our very own Nashville, Tennessee. Not literally. Uh, he is very much figurative. <laughs> destroying. I want you to, to make sure. With this kind of I want to make lately. absolutely <laughs> sure that the police and all the enforcers on Twitter know that Matt is not literally destroying <laughs> uh, this hospital. Matt. Tell us what's going on. Well, you know, we have Vanderbilt Hospital, which is right next door to us. Yeah. And uh, so we became curious about their gender, their transgender program. They have a transgender clinic. And so we started digging into it. We spent uh, a good week looking into it. And the interesting thing is that, is that uh, you know, all of these gender clinics across the country have been just posting videos with abandon, admitting to all kinds of horrific things. But then yeah, over the last... nothing. Right, exactly. And over the last couple of, of months, as, as the terrorists like myself have been calling attention to it, they're, they're, now they're going through and deleting things. So it's uh, a little more difficult than you might think to find some of this stuff. But we went through and you, know, you kind of see the, the story and you, and you see it all through the videos they've posted. Uh, the, the, the clinic opened up in 2018 and uh, there's actually a video that we posted on, on Twitter of a woman explaining, a doctor there explaining how she convinced Vanderbilt to start a transgender clinic, and she said that uh, it's it, mercy, compassion for children who are living with gender dysphoria. Right. Well, it's it's that it's it's a, she said it's a we we told them it's the right thing to do, but also there's a lot of money. It's a big money maker, and she goes through all the money they have to make uh, with these with these gender surgeries. And the interesting thing about that is that she acknowledges that the reason why these surgeries are so profitable is because of all the follow ups. So. Uh, it basically, when you do the surgery to someone, it means that they're now condemned to a life of returning to the hospital over and over again. She said that she, she boasted that uh, bottom surgeries for women, for example, making a fake penis is worth $100,000 a pop to the hospital. How large is the fake penis? Because I'm a wealthy, wealthy man. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I don't know, I haven't got that, I didn't get that deep into the research, but. Uh, get back then, to me. And then you, you get, so they, so they, start the, they start the transgender clinic, and then now they're concerned that there might be staff members at the hospital that aren't on board with doing these kinds of things. We have another video of a woman at a lecture talking to staff members at the hospital, telling them that if you conscientiously object to performing these surgeries, that is problematic, there will be consequences, and you shouldn't work at Vanderbilt. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm pretty sure telling someone explicitly that if you use your religious freedom, there's gonna be consequences for it, doesn't seem legal to me. And then they also, they, they, they still were not uh, sure that staff members were fully on board, so they started a first-in-its-nation program called the Trans Buddy Program, where they, hi, where they have these volunteer activists, trans activists in the community, that will come in and attend appointments with trans patients to, they say, watch the doctors to make sure that the, monitor the doctors to make sure that they're, uh, that they're not unsafe, wow. uh, which means that they're not misgendering. And they say that this is available to, to children too. And then we get to the, ch the, the, the children piece of this. And uh, if you dig deep enough, you can find that they, they give chemical castration drugs to children. They sterilize children. They give irreversible hormones to children as young as 13. They admit all this on video. They do double mastectomies for girls as young as 16. Um, some of this they've they've deleted from you know from the sites where they put it, but it's all there. Uh, so, kind of to review, they started doing this in 2018 because of the money. They admit it. Uh, they threaten doctors to make them go along with it, and now they're chemically castrating and sterilizing children, and it's all there. Right now, Candace, you had Perez Hilton on your show just this week to talk about his position is that this is all fully reversible, right? Yeah, I mean, his position to me really reflects the left's position. It's very emblematic of it. He just views this as an opinion. And he yeah. kept saying this word over and over again. Well, it's just my opinion. You know, it's just my opinion. It's like, 
you are entitled to your own opinions, but we are actually, we need to talk, have a fact-based discussion when we're talking about the mutilation of children, because that's what it is. And I think the thing that was sad in having that discussion is I was very open, you know, I, I did not want to press him at all. I wanted him to actually hear from Scott Nugent, yes. uh, who had already been through all of this, but he was unwilling to edit his quote-unquote opinion after being presented with the facts, uh, because it is a religion, well, right? The left is, it's a cult, it's a religion. So it's just, we'll sacrifice children on the altar of wokeism. I will say good on him for coming on the show. Not very many people uh, with whom we disagree will actually come on our on our shows and defend their positions. It's an amazing piece of content. It's available at Daily Wire Plus for uh, our subscribers as part of this broad initiative that we have really between now and the year to really enhance the value of our offering behind our paywall. So you can see that uh, you can see that interview with Perez Hilton and, and Candace and Scott Nugent. You can also see our new member block, which we're adding to every show, including the new five day a week. Candace Owens, uh, where you get to hear, uh, we get to hear from you and take questions and, and give you a little bit more content that's only available to members. And that includes this show. So immediately following this show, we'll have 20 minutes devoted just to interacting uh, with our Daily Wire Plus members. Uh, as a sign of our appreciation, they're, they're truly who keep us in business. Uh, and so again, we're trying to really enhance that. And I think one of our great pieces of content so far is this terrific interview that Candace did with Perez Hilton. Matt, you're you're obviously on kind of a one-man crusade here, uh, you know, trying to ex expose exactly what's happening in these hospitals and happening uh, to kids around the country. What is the reaction? What What are you actually hearing out there in response to the work that you're doing? Uh, I, I've to this thing about Vanderbilt, the reaction has been—I mean, it's been pretty extraordinary just in the last couple of hours. I, I, I wasn't totally sure yep. how people would react because we've heard a lot about these these hospitals recently. I don't know if it's. People have it just all kind of becomes background noise, but um, I think that the one thing that that is very clear to me from making the film "What Is a Woman" to everything else we've been doing, that people really just don't know. They don't realize that this stuff is happening. Uh, I think the average American, if you go up to them on the street even now, and you bring up, you know, uh, that children are being castrated, they would say, "Well, that's not happening." And it's like, of course, that's illegal. Yeah. And but but it it is happening. It's happening in every state, and it's it's not actually illegal in any state. It's, it is not currently illegal to chemically castrate children in any state. Mm. And the reason why it's not illegal, even though they're in many of these states like this one, you could easily pass a law and almost everyone would support it. But the reason why it's not illegal is just because people don't realize that it's happening, which again goes back to, that's why it's so extraordinary. Well, it never needed to be illegal. Right, it never needed right. need to be legal <laughs> until until the last like eight or nine right. years. And and for the last eight or nine years, these they the, the gender ideologues, the gender ideology brigade, they've been out in the open talking about do, how they're doing this. They've been very open about it. This um, is, in many ways, this is like abortion in that people just actually don't know. I was just at the live action gala, great pro life organization over the weekend, and they had an amazing statistic that they've figured out through their own internal research, which is that when pe people who are pro choice are presented with their information. 19% of those people change their views in the pro-life direction just by seeing the pictures and the stories and the facts. The reality. So you're saying it's almost one in five. And it's because people just don't really know what an abortion looks like, what it really means. And I think when it comes to transgenderism, people don't realize that gender-affirming surgery means you hack off little girls' forearms and you hack off parts of their calves and you construct a fake, meaty, disgusting, pseudo-genital. And it's so ghastly, it's out of the most dystopian novel. If you just show people what that is, it's not going to be one in five who change their opinion. It's going to be four in five. And it I, might be even more. And I can't agree that this is a religion in the sense, unless you mean like some Mayan, you know, apocalyptic <laughs> you know, child sacrifice. But, but religion, you know, is kind of a reasonable thing garnered from faith and from reasoning about the world. This is mental illness, an upsurge of mental illness in this country that I've never seen before. But you read about it in history, the kind of thing people go mad. And I, and I think this is a mass uh, upsurge of mental illness followed by the atrocities that mentally ill people would commit if you agreed with their delusions. Well, what's really amazing about it is to watch as the scientific community mirrors the, the woke preferences of political class. Yeah. And that's been the theme, obviously, over the last several years, is how science, which was supposed to be the one thing that the Enlightenment gave us that was actually useful, because <laughs> it actually you know increased living standards and increased our technological <clears throat> ability to do things and, and increased life expectancy, and, and how quickly science made itself subject to the woke diktat is really astonishing on everything from COVID to, obviously, this this is the most obvious example, 
you know, when, when, you, when Matt, you talk about, you know, what they're actually doing to children, it is impossible realistically to separate that from stories like the one that we saw over in Canada, which I'm sure we all covered, uh, this, this insane story of this high school teacher in Canada <laughs> who is a man who walked into a high school wearing what effectively looked like beach balls in his shirt. <laughs> size Z is yeah, what I called with, it on my show. With, 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 with size fake, Z. It's prosthetic breasts that are like beach balls with, with like fake nipples on the end. And the... Students, right? You're talking like a George Clooney level Batman <laughs> fake nipple. <laughs> oh, much, not quite that. Much, not that intense. Much, okay. Yeah, and and the students took pictures of this and, and everything. And the school district came to the defense of this man and said, "Well, he's he's a woman. I mean, he's a, he's a transgender woman, and this person has the right to gender identity." And the thing is that when when you recognize that this is all part of the same playbook, that that the same yep. people who are saying that this man who is wearing the, who's acting out a sexual fetish in front of children, I mean, that's what that is. That isn't even somebody who's, who's saying, I'm a man who believes I'm a woman. That's saying, I wish to act out a bizarre sexual fetish that nobody's ever heard of in front of minors. And when, when this is now seen as an aspect of gender identity, and you're supposed to mirror that in Canada, because if you don't, then you might be in violation of anti-discrimination laws in places like Canada. You could have your livelihood taken away from you. You could be sued. I mean, could, there are real consequences to this right. sort of stuff in an anti-free speech nation now like Canada. That is part and parcel of the scientific community in the United States and Canada and other places that buy into the idea that boys can become girls, girls can become boys. And the way that all of this works is that you just hack some body parts off of people and you sterilize the children. But what, what about in America now? So obviously America's hat up in Canada always does crazy stuff avant-garde. But what about in America after Bostock, after a conservative Supreme Court justice sided with the libs and enshrined SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity, into civil rights law? What if this happened at a school in America? Would you see the same kind of arguments? I mean, you definitely sure. could. You definitely could. I mean, it's a serious, in fact, there was a, a case that just came up in Montana in which a judge ordered the state legislature had passed a bill. The state legislature said you're not allowed to change your birth certificate to your new assumed gender. Right? If you're born male, your birth certificate stays male because you were born a male. The judge overruled that law, struck it down and said that he would hold in contempt anybody who continued to maintain that you could not change the sex on your birth certificate, which is the ultimate retconning of science. Because That's right. no matter what you are or say you are now, when you were born, we knew exactly what you were. I mean, you could just look at you and we knew what you were. And so, you know, 100%, this is a serious issue. And what the, what the Supreme Court seems to be doing, and it's really quite frightening, is they are doing what they call the Utah Compromise. The idea being that they are going to expand the anti-discrimination law to include sexual orientation, gender identity, but then they'll have religious clawbacks. So if you say you're a religious person, then there'll be a carve out for you. But here's the thing. You shouldn't have to be a religious person to yeah. say true things about gender and identity saw, and sexual orientation. You should not. As we saw at Vanderbilt, if you, if you supposedly when you when you want to use your religious exemption, there could still be consequences. Right, because so what they say, what they always right. say about religion is that religion is just covered for your bigotry. Right, this is the right. this is the line you always get is that it's not really that you have an, a really religious belief that, for example, men are men and women are women, and that there are hierarchies in terms of the morality right. of sexual sexual activity. None of that's really a religious belief, they say. What they say is that that's just your bigotry speaking, and so you use the Bible as a cover for your actual bigotry. And it's also and so not— You it's, don't need the Bible or, the, or, or any of the rest of this. You could just use you know, science and logic to come up with some basic natural law explanations of how human people yeah. are supposed to act in sexual context. But we're not allowed to do that either. That has now been relegated by the Supreme Court to only crazy religious people believe that. But they say it's for their crazy religion, then maybe we'll let them do it sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, this, this very issue, of course— uh, did the most damaging thing possible. I mean, yes, there's the mutilation of children. Yes, there's the advancing uh, of mental illness and the elevation of mental illness in our society, but it also cost me some money. What happened is uh, Michael Knowles and Candace had a conversation, not on the Daily Wire at all, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, about <laughs> gender dysphoria. And our friends over at Harry's Razors, for whom we had been advertising for some time, uh, you know, sharing our, the goodwill of our audience and exposing them to their products, I decided that they not only weren't going to put up with you guys talking about that on some other platform, uh, but they uh, were also going to condemn our audience as being, you know, having values misalignment and being retrograde and all this stuff. I don't remember their exact, uh, uh, irreconcilable differences, essentially. Uh, anyway, that pissed me off real good. And if you remember, uh, at that time, I thought that a funny thing to do would be to launch a multi-million dollar business. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's always, to me, the funniest joke is the joke that you take to the absolute <laughs> Extreme. Most expensive extreme. <laughs> exactly. The more expensive, the better. And so we launched Jeremy's Razors, and it's done very well over these last five months. We've sold 85,000 uh, Razor subscriptions. People are loving the product because it's fantastic. Uh, I have our founder's kit right here, and they wanted me to use it as a prop and unzip it and show you all the things that are in it, but I'm just going to, spoiler alert, it's a razor. With razor blades. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful razor. You're going to love it. Um, 
But what's happening next with Jeremy's Razors? This is the question I always get. And it, it occurred to me that there's a real problem. Obviously, if you want to stop giving your money to woke corporations that hate you, you're giving your money to Jeremy's Razors. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're not buying. If you're watching this program, you're not buying your razors from Harry's or Gillette anymore uh, and, and literally propping up their socialist leftist fantasy agenda with your money. But what about your friends? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You've still got friends. If your friend thinks Taco Tuesday is a form of cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. they need a Jeremy's Razor. They do. <laughs> if your friend, they wrote these, these are not my lines. <laughs> Preach. Preach, Jeremy. If your friend insists that, fan, that uh, fantasy football draft should start with a land acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we're launching this amazing competition, the, the, comp the contest for a car over at jeremysrazors.com slash play. And here's the thing. You can send out a unique referral link you can start sharing that around to your friends, and someone is going to win the God King's McLaren. So I know if you're if you're watching this show, you're probably watching it backstage live when I said it's not actually my McLaren. But here's how far I'm willing to take a joke. I bought the damn McLaren. <laughs> <laughs> I bought the McLaren so that I could give it away to whoever actually wins the contest for the car and refers the largest number of people, rescues the largest number of their friends. <laughs> Uh, from the tyranny of woke razor companies. It should be you. I'm just going to tell you, I bought the car. I have not driven it. <laughs> I drove the car once in the commercial. So it's used. <laughs> God kings don't drive used McLarens. Mm -hmm. So it's in a very lovely air-conditioned facility here in Nashville, and it's just waiting to become yours. Head over to uh, head over to jeremysrazors.com slash play. Get your unique referral code. Send it around to your friends. Rescue them from the tyranny of woke razors. They'll get $12 off of their Founders Series Shave Kit. You'll get credit uh, for that you can put against all the sort of upcoming Jeremy's products by Black Friday. We're going to have, well, I won't spoil it here. That's another announcement. Lots of amazing new products are coming. And most importantly, you'll get points in the race to win the God Kings McLaren. You'll also get points by referring Daily Wire Plus memberships to your friends. So get out there. We've got six weeks. On November 1st, we're going to declare the winner. They're going to get those keys to that beautiful McLaren 600. It's one of, I mean, there fewer than 600 of these were even made. It truly is an unbelievable vehicle, and I truly can't be seen in a used sports car. <laughs> so head over again, jeremysrazors.com slash play. Uh, we're kicking this off right now. In fact, Michael, you were a part of the, the actual release. I, I was in the video. I was in the McLaren. I may have been in the McLaren more than you have been in the McLaren. Certainly. I, I think I know the answer to this. Because, as I just mentioned, to you, the, the funniness of the joke depends upon how expensive it is. Yes. Are, are you actually giving away the McLaren? Oh, yeah. I'm actually giving away the McLaren. <laughs> as I said, the McLaren, Michael, is used. I cannot <laughs> stress, I no, cannot no, stress right. it. As a partner in this business, <laughs> I, I do wish that some things had been run by me mm -hmm. before Jeremy went and purchased an extraordinarily expensive vehicle to give it away. You know what he was thinking? I I, I actually bought the car personally. The business did not buy the car because it had to be it, around. it had to be the God King's McLaren, right? It couldn't be the Daily Wires McLaren. That's yeah, not cool. That's I know I know what was going through your head. You said this company, which was really it just started as kind of a vindictive joke against Harry's, it, yes. it was too shockingly profitable. So you said that we cannot <laughs> have that. We've got to put that money back into a car. Yeah. Yeah. I just say, feel like I should get credit. I just feel like I should get credit for this. I'm the one that posed that mm -hmm. question to you on an yeah. entirely different platform in which you answered. By the way, behind why every great male idea is a woman that is being born. And for some reason, they came after me when <laughs> truly all I did was agree with the point you made. And they said, Knowles, that horrible bigot, he agreed with Candace. You're welcome. Yep. <laughs> I just want to say, I, this is tough for me to see that someone's going to get this really nice car because I just went literally today and bought a used 12-passenger van for my, for my one million kids. I'm <laughs> the trad wagon? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, I went to a Chevrolet. car dealership that operates out of a motel, which is true, <laughs> and I bought a 12-passenger van. <laughs> so I will, ne I will never drive a car like that. I got too many no. kids. So my original idea was to have you guys compete against each other to win the car. Oh, my gosh. And then legal said that that absolutely could not happen. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Even, I, even if it was, we just did it as like a gladiator fight where we just beat the crap out of each other? No, that, that's exactly <laughs> what I had in mind. Who did I mean, you think I, was going to win? That's a very important question. And it's the only one who could possibly drive the car. Yeah. Obviously. The rest of us would be pulled over just for being in the car. <laughs> there was a Digiday story this week about 
media companies launching consumer goods businesses and how they all failed. And I thought, it's so interesting that the left can't grant any of our successes. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Daily Wire is one of the biggest media companies, and we've launched a successful consumer goods business. So they just ignore our existence altogether. It well, doesn't fit their Or they try to de-platform. That, that, That's right. So the CBC this week put out a story suggesting, once again, that I'm mainlining people directly into extremism. And it was it was pretty great. I mean, the, the story yeah, itself yeah. Was, was a lot of fun. It, it, it said, well, he is not associated with any known hate group. He does hold, <laughs> what about he does hold extremist views. And then the extremist view was that I had said that gender dysphoria is a mental illness. So yeah. me and the DSM-5. Yeah, I was going to say right. that the used to be us, known. Right, the two of us, DSM-5. gender identity disorder, me and every psychologist in America. Um, until, and, uh, until five minutes ago. Yeah, well, I mean, still. I mean, gender dysphoria in the DSM-5 is a mental disorder. I mean, that, that is what it is. I like when they make fun of us for being moral. Like, I barely tweet anymore, but I went onto Twitter and they were talking about me and Ben having this discussion about how pornography is bad for relationships. Mm-hmm. And they were, like, mocking us. And I just went to myself, okay, uh, I guess because we're being moral and we're discussing the corrosion <laughs> right. that, the way, of that, American that values. Is that is what it is. So I, I was trying to- They I mock like, morality. I was racking my brain for, like, what was the thing that was my extreme moral view? Because they were like, well, you know, these, the, he has extreme views on objectification of women. I was like, uh, have you met me? I'm an Orthodox Jew. Objectification of women, like, ain't in the in the arts. So your extreme view you. is you're against it. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, then, and then they said something about masculinity. And I'm like, my extreme view on masculinity is that men should get a job, get married, support their kids, and raise them. Like, they, I, I know, very extreme stuff. And then I realized that the actual extreme view is, of course, all of those things, plus the idea that as I said before, certain types of sexual activity are more moral than other types of sexual activity. And this is the one big thing you are not allowed to say in the United States. You're not allowed to say that any type of sexual activity is more or less moral than any other type of Mm -hmm. sexual activity because we have boiled down identity in the United States to who you want to screw. And if if you doubt in any way, shape, or form that somebody's choices on this front are, are either less moral than another person's choice, without even talking about government regulation, if you doubt that, then you are a bigot. Yeah. And you well, unless a, unless a you're a straight man not attracted to trans women. In which well, case that's they, true. In which case they can condemn you. For, that's right. Yeah. I had a conversation with a gay friend last night who, and it was all about this topic, the topic of identity, that the the worst lie that's been peddled, I think really on, on the entire country, and uh, in particular, it's been peddled on young people and it's been peddled on gay men in particular, uh, is that your sexuality is the, the central defining aspect 100%. of your identity. Yep. Uh, and... Partially because I'm a Protestant and a contrarian, and those two things probably go hand in hand. Identity is like one of the most important topics to me, and I think that a person is is uh, should craft their identity. I think that the most American thing that one can do is to is not to say, "I'll pick on you, Michael, just for a minute." You're you're obviously very proudly an Italian and American, and you eat meatballs. And yeah. one time, yeah. one time, I, I remember an actual kill an, people. And yeah, I, yeah, that's right. <laughs> piano, piano wire. I actually remember there was a whole year where Michael would, for breakfast, bring a pizza pie mm-hmm. to the Daily Wire. Extra would, large, extra, extra large. large pizza, the, yeah. He was trying to get in shape for a movie that Drew and I were never going to catch. Him in. <laughs> I remember this actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I gained twenty pounds of muscle. You did. Yeah, I did. And then well, I stopped, you gained twenty pounds yeah, of muscle. I gained no. I, I, I realized there's, there's one thing you're supposed to do. They say you gain all the all the muscle, and then you're supposed to cut. I didn't cut. Uh, I no. never did the cut. <laughs> but I think that saying I'm an Italian American can be taken to a bad place. Yeah. And that one of the things that's great about America is that we get to sort of look at the world and choose the best parts and kind of and, and build the individual out of those best parts. You're you're not just an Italian American. I mean, the queen died this week. Yeah. I was moved by it. I'm I'm as far as I know not British. My ancestry isn't British, but I can look at uh, the role that Britain has played in world history. I can look at the at the work of uh, Queen Elizabeth over the 70 years uh, of her reign and see something that I want to emulate, see values that I think are good. And I want to I want to appropriate, which I think is a very good term, I want to appropriate the best things from around the world and build sort of a uniquely American identity or a uniquely Jeremy identity. That doesn't mean throwing out the past. It just means that we get to be selective about the past. We, I say all the time, I want to take the very best ideas of the past and build a future on top of those. I want to dismiss the very worst ideas of the past and not include those in the future that I think that we can all build together. But what we've said to young people and gay men in America is all you are. You're not the best ideas of the past. You're not the best ideas of your heart. You're not, you're not the best ideas you've had. You're not you a are, pianist or a cellist or a woodworker right. or no. That's right. You are only this thing. Well, that's a Freudian. And, right? I mean, it's, it's it, take off on Freud. It, it grows from Freud, but it also eliminates the 
entire creative tension that America has exemplified between identity and role. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that, yes, I want to do this, but it might be wrong. It might be bad for my spirit. Yes, I come from this, these descendants, but I want to go in a new way. And that creates a tension. All our movies are about this get out and the Godfather about, you know, I, I want to be an American, but something else is pulling me. And that is an incredibly creative way to live because it is, it exemplifies the spiritual life. The spiritual yeah. life is that I'm in this body that wants certain things, but not all of the things it wants are good for me. And you so know, we're in this, this, is one way, this wonderful you know, tension. Speaking of sort of Hollywood and, and, the, and all of this, you can see the evolution in movies of how narrative has changed in America, right? All the movies used to be about how I'm driven to do this thing that, that would be my bliss, but I have this role and I have this duty, and so I have to actually do this role in this duty, and it's really important that I fulfill this role in this duty. And now every movie is precisely the opposite. Society is calling on me to do this thing, but I'm going to break free and be me, and being me is the most important thing that there can possibly be. You see it in the, in, in the Disney universe, to, we'll get to, I'm sure, Matt's, uh, Matt's Disney comments uh, in just a second, but the Disney universe went from Jiminy Cricket saying, always let your conscience be your guide, <laughs> right. to Ilsa singing, no right, no wrong, no rules, I'm free, right? I mean, like the, the idea in, in Disney movies has explicitly moved away from the idea of you're supposed to have a role within a certain confine to find your bliss, be yourself, and being yourself is the greatest hero you can yeah, be. I, 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 was, I, do, I do think that Americans can be uniquely individuals, that you can be yourself. It's who, your, who your true self is isn't utterly unmoored from reality. I like the term classical liberalism as a descriptor for my views, Classical is a major part of the term, right? It's not. It's not freedom. Uh, having it's not throw away the past and you will be free. But it's within the best ideas of the past there is a freedom. In the what? religious worldview, the idea is that you are a biological being yes. and you have to reach beyond yourself to values that are far beyond you, and you have to fulfill roles in order to reach those values. Right? I mean, this, there, there's an interplay between you and civilization. The process of raising a child is taking what is essentially a piece of raw biological material and turning that into a civilized human being. This was the process of, of actually civilizing people. And we've decided civilization is bad. It's an imposition on people. Yep. And because civilization yes. is an imposition on people, civilization itself must be wrecked and it must be ruined. I, by the way, I think that you see a lot of this in the in the rage at the British Empire and the rage at, at yep. Queen Elizabeth yeah. II. The idea is that that, that that great clip of Don Lemon today. The Don Lemon oh, clip. It's a it spectacular clip. Yeah. But the, you know, yeah. this is why I think we, we actually keep failing on the transgender stuff. Is, be, is because we're not taking this conversation to heart yep. as conservatives. Because w what we keep doing is falling into the same sort of liberal trap of, of reducing everything to, to chromosomes, you know, to biology and, and who we are and identity and rights instead of what, what we're all talking about right now, which is duty and obligation. That's what Edmund Burke talked about. Edmund Burke this is a way, I, I already regret that I'm going to say this, but this is a way in which Knowles is right about <laughs> the, both the Reformation and the Enlightenment. The solution to the violence that grew out of the uh, religious division that came with the Reformation was basically to say to each his own, uh, we're not going to solve this problem. We're going to separate. Do it, do it. Say it. Say it. Say it. What? Say peace of Westphalia. The peace of Westphalia. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> My big That's a record. Card. That's a record. 27 minutes. Yeah. That's a record. Well, I also, I also think. But, 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 but let me just, just finish the, the idea that the more conflicts you, result, you take away, theoretically, the more peace there'll be, right? So if there's no ar moral arguments to be had, we won't get into moral arguments. And of course, it works like everything on the left. It works exactly the opposite. But if you remove all this tension, you remove all the source of creativity in life, all the, all the fights between the many and the few, all the fights between freedom and equality, all those things that have been the creative engine of our lives uh, are taken away. And you're left with nothing but this kind of flat deadness of desire where you want and you get and then you, you feel bad, but you can't say so. Yep. I agree with with all of this, but I also I also sort of feel that if you ask someone what's your identity or how do you identify or where do you find your identity, I think maybe the healthiest answer to get from someone is sort of I don't know what do you, why are you asking me that because another problem is that we spend we spend so much time I, I think this was a a change in Western cultures we spend all this time sort of like peering back within ourselves yes. and and constantly thinking well who am I and why am I here and what. What is, uh, well, not even why I'm here, just who am I and how do I feel and where do I find my identity? And it's just this constant peering back within yourself. You kind of get lost, you get sort of like sucked into yourself like a black hole and just yeah. everything gets sucked along with you. I think, I think the, the, the most, if you, if you go to cultures where they don't, they don't have this hang up and you ask them these questions, yeah, they find their identity and duties and responsibilities and all of that is true. But if you ask them, where do you find your identity? They, they'll just look at you like, what kind of question is that? The only it, thing they might they, say they inhabit, they, Right, they inhabit their identity so so clearly that they don't even think about it, and so that's one of the that's one of the problems is even by having this conversation, 
It's sort of like we're, we're making identity complicated. But there is a but simple answer, actually. Because of what Jeremy said. I mean, it, 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 American identity is complicated. It does require, I think, more thought because we are making choices that no one has ever made before. I agree with before. you. you know, I, I, Obviously, has, you're agreeing with me. Yeah, well, <laughs> has anybody seen the TikTok domino video of the guy telling you every feeling that he has as a, yes. as a domino? I thought that was the culture in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. The thing, it's a very beautiful domino thing where it, it falls in different ways and different colors fall over. And each second, of it. He says, oh, that makes me feel good. Oh, that makes me feel angry. Now I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm so happy that happened. Mm. Now, like, that's the culture in a nutshell. It's not that we search for identity, which I think is a complicated American thing to do. It's that we care about every little damn thing. <laughs> and that's not the point at all. But and, is and it to the religious man, our identity is supposed to in some way, yes, in some ways be caught up in duties and caught up in role, but caught up in God. You know, the, the Christian answer is that our identity is in Christ. Well, no, and I'm the really, Jewish really answer, canceling and razors. The, <laughs> and the Jewish answer is that our identity is not in Christ. This is a mild guys, disagreement. He's a, he's you know. Australia. <laughs> Australia. Yeah. Didn't we still no, get to kill you guys? This, this? Is, <laughs> this is the simple answer, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> God, God at the, in the burning bush talks to Moses and he says, my name is I am who I am and I am essence itself. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so you, you know, if you find your identity in being, in I am who I am, then it's pretty simple. And by the way, a lot of that downstream comes to duty and role and here's what you're supposed to do. But there's also jazz. Like I don't want to be I, I'm not a conser I'm not a conservative in the in the fundamental sense. Uh, I don't think that our that we are born into sort of a gray life in which we must live out our precise duty and do exactly what was done before us. Of course I don't think that. We're we're to be free and I, I love the complexity of American identity. We we do have the opportunity to to play jazz, but the thing about jazz or the thing about the great impressionist painters is the, the impressionists were good painters. Hmm. And the great jazz they musicians are good musicians. They know the rules. They the know the difference between John Coltrane playing notes and you playing notes on a trumpet. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, That's and, exactly right. And we've no. completely obliterated this. This is one of the problems, actually, I mean, as our friend Dennis Prager would say, in art, this is one of the big problems, that the people who yeah. knew how to color outside the lines also knew how to color inside the lines. They knew the purpose of the lines. And now, art is basically, we don't know the purpose of the lines, we don't know the purpose of, of any, and, and that's true in society also. What is the purpose of these roles? Why do we even need these roles? What if we right. just explode these roles? And one of the big problems is that in a post-enlightenment era, one of the things that we've done is, now I'm going to quote Oakshot again. Here we we're, go, we're baby. Gonna, yeah, we're doing Michael, it. Michael's oh my, jam right We're going here. far oh, right is, tonight. You're just yeah, a exactly. corrupting is, character. Is, is yeah. the, it uh, turns out Michael is the gateway drug. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But, the, but the, the, you know, Peter, Peter Bogosian, uh, he, he put out that picture that I was talking about earlier of that person in Toronto who's, who's wearing like, like the fake breasts. And he said, you know, try to explain to somebody, like just in a rationalistic way, we all have the gut feeling this should not be exposed to children. Now try to explain to somebody in a rationalistic way why this shouldn't be exposed mm -hmm. to children. You can do it, but it's a little bit like you have to think about it for a second. And the answer is, you shouldn't have to think about it for a second. You should say this is this should not be exposed to children. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you a bad person. It's okay to have an instinct where you say this is not appropriate for children because we have the inherited wisdom of ages saying this right. is not appropriate for children. And tossing that out as a source of data is a real mistake. And one of the things that we've done in, in, in a very American post-enlightenment post way is we basically said, if I can't justify it, it should be discarded. And that's not the way that you approach now, change. I, 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 can, I cannot tell you how much I agree with this. I, I've been, for the last few weeks, I've been talking to people about things that you should just not do because you should just not do them, like chemically castrating young healthy boys or cutting the breasts off young healthy girls. Like there shouldn't, that shouldn't be a conversation. There should not be, an, that actually is a conversation with only one side. Stop doing that. Right. And, and you know, you only have to go back. I mean, I, I know this is such an over, it's become such an overused trope, but it's still a good thing to remember that the the logic, so many of the, of the Nazis who were tried after the war said, well, you know, this wasn't my business. This was the business of, of medical people. And you'd say, why medical people? Well, it was death. That's a medical thing, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to deal with it. You think there are certain things that you do where you just say, don't do that. It's now, it's good to live, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll back out, but it's good to live in a culture. A free culture has a healthy left. And a, yes. a healthy left should be able to ask incredibly challenging questions. They should posit questions even, I mean, I can't say that they should posit should we chemically castrate children, but many of the things that we discuss should be posited but what, where we've arrived in critical theory in this country is that simply by positing the question, you've abolished the standard. Well, they, they that's, reversed that's, the, they, that, that's, that's what's they, wrong. They reversed the burden of proof, right? That's no, right. Normally when you come and you, and you actually change a thing, the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate why the thing should be changed. That's and right. Instead what they've said is, 
we don't have to show you why the thing should be changed. We don't have to show you what the effect of will be of changing the thing. Me asking you to justify it. And if you don't give me an answer that I like, I can just blow it up. Yep. And that's not the way that good change ever gets done. I mean, if you were to, if you were to design a device in a lab and somebody designed half of it and you came to them and you're like, I want you to explain every little bit and pieces. I don't like it, you smash it. And you have to explain what you're going to do next with the, with the pieces that are there that is going to be better than what's already been built. And the left feels no onus to do any of this. They, they just believe that if you destroy all the pieces of this particular machine, they can, just on faith, on, on faith in themselves, that they can rebuild this incredibly complex structure that, by the way, was not actually thought out. It evolved over time. Exactly. Hey, this is the truth about human systems. Human systems are evolutionary. They are not rationalistic. Now you are a Burkean, too. You're according yeah. to no, this is all, I mean, this, is, uh, <laughs> but, I mean this, this was all well-known. I mean, yes. even, even the people who we talk about as classical liberals, until you, got to basically, uh, until you got to basically John Stuart Mill, even they acknowledge that most yeah. of the things that we believe are not things that we can actually rationalize. I mean, David yeah. Hume says this, right? And David Hume is a, a real classical liberal. So even classical liberals understood you know, that, they're, that you inherit wisdom and that most wisdom is not something that came up out of your head tabula rasa. And this idea that you can just create a system of rules based on your own logic is completely insane. Matt, we interrupted yeah. you a few times. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the left's, that, that's why the, the left's basic tactic here is to make simple things complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, they, they, they don't have to explain anything. The point you made about burden of proof is so important. I, I think that's exactly the point. You know, if somebody comes along and says, uh, you know, my, my pronouns are Zs or Zem, uh, why won't you use them? Why won't you use the pronouns? It's like, no, you tell me why I should. Give me a good reason why I yeah. should. It's on you. But I also think that all, all they do is they take these very simple innate things and they, and they, they don't offer any evidence. They just throw a lot of words and make it very complicated. I mean, the Atlantic had a, a, an article about why, <laughs> you know, actually we shouldn't be sex segregating sports. Everyone thinks we should, but we shouldn't. But you read the article, <laughs> read the article, and, and the article actually links to studies too. I read the studies because nobody actually does it. There's nothing there. It's just a bunch of words. There's no conclusions. It's just all, it's, it's, all it is is obfuscation to, to make it seem complicated. At the end, they hope that you kind of throw your hands up and say, I don't understand this. And then they come along and say, well, I've got the credentials. You know, Jack Turbin, this... Yes. Uh, Jack Turbin, this, uh, this, not only these gender ideology doctors. But he's been liar. to every fancy school in America right. for 37 right. years. Right. He, right. He, he, tweeted, he tweeted this week that he's got 15 years in Ivy League schools. So basically just you know, <laughs> ba back away and leave him alone. But it's like, you spent 15 years in, in Ivy League schools. You know less about biology than my five-year-old. But I, I guess How is that? My point, right. I got to give Jack back Turbin up, a little man. credit. I mean, I've been, I've been fighting Jack Turbin on, online and many, you know, for, I remember that guy, guy first popped up and he seemed so crazy and he is so crazy. But his point in that tweet where he was bragging about all the stupid degrees, you know, 15 years at Harvard, he doesn't know what the difference between a boy and a girl is. But he said, you know, the, the best you guys on the right can come up with is talking about chromosomes. And that's actually <laughs> not true. What we're saying is that men and women are different and you can see this in chromosomes and elsewhere. But furthermore, men have an obligation to act like men. And women have an obligation and a duty to act like women. And there's actually a, a role for people in society. And that, I think, would make the guy's head explode. This, 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 this is why it's very important that Candace not get any credit <laughs> for anything that she does. And yes. I want to talk about how little... Because women are to be seen and not heard. And I want to talk about... <laughs> Specific instances of Candace <laughs> rightly not getting credit for her brilliance, but first. So if this conversation makes you want to die the way it does me, well, you might want to think at this point about getting some life insurance. We pay hundreds of dollars per year to protect our homes, our cars, even our phones. Too many of us aren't taking steps to protect our families' finances. I mean, the fact is, you need life insurance. I mean, bad news. We're all going to buy it. You know, that we... We all go out only one way. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies in one place to find your lowest price on life insurance. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Options start at just $17 per month for $500,000 of coverage, although not for Andrew Clavin. Just head on over to policygenius.com, get personalized quotes in minutes, find the right policy for your needs. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They are on hand to help you throughout the entire process and make sure that you can make the decisions that you make with confidence. They're not going to sell your details to third parties. They're not going to add on any extra fees. Policy Genius has options that offer coverage in as little as a week. They avoid the unnecessary medical exam. So head on over to policygenius.com. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save before you expire from another piece of Westphalia reference. <laughs> <laughs> April 22nd, the year of our Lord, 2022. <laughs> our friend, Jack Basobiak. Bussing illegals to D.C. doesn't seem to be doing much of anything. In reply, mm. Candace Owens, now five days a week at Daily Wire Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Bust them to Martha's Vineyard. 
Wow. <laughs> Behold! Wow. Behold the policy genius. <laughs> oh, man. We'll never get credit for this. I was just like, am I really not going to get credit for this? His whole team follows me. We're just going to go ahead and let him say this was his genius policy idea. I was like, okay, that's fine. He didn't fine. bust them, though. He flew them. That's true. And I just tweeted. So I guess he did. <laughs> 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 he did technically do more. But yes, that policy was informed from my Twitter uh, feed. It was so obvious to me. It was, it, you know, the inner city communities is where crime and corruption happens anyway. So it's right. like, you know, okay, yes, it's already bad. We're going to turn it into Gotham City. Sure. <laughs> if you really want to make them uncomfortable, obviously, when they're, you know, when they leave the city, they go to Martha's Vineyard, they go to Montauk. They go, you know, this is the places that if you really want to see policy change really quickly, you should ship them. And so DeSantis, it is totally fine that you stole my idea and made it yours. <laughs> how you, gracious man. of you. At least, yeah, how gra- yeah, exactly, exactly. It's totally fine, and I am going to be humble and say that it was totally my idea that you did it. <laughs> but I'm glad you had the courage to do it. I love it. And I think it's great. I love about women, the way they stand running. behind men. And if anyone's looking Your for a hard. potential running mate, DeSantis and Candace kind of rhymes. Wow. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> this is one of the best stories of the week, and just before we went on the air, Ben pointed out to me that Apparently, in the, this particular group of illegal immigrants has already f- fully embraced the American way of life and sued DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> they, did. they did. They issued a lawsuit just before the show began oh. uh, in which they are claiming false imprisonment. They are claiming failure of due process. Hmm. Uh, they're claiming only the federal government really gets to, I guess, ship them to random towns in the Southwest and just leave them there at bus stops, which is what the federal government does by the hundreds of thousands every single year. That's right. But Ron DeSantis putting them on an air-conditioned charter plane after they signed forms saying they would like to go on these air-conditioned charter planes and then being shipped up to Martha's Vineyard where they greatly enrich the lives of all of the <laughs> white, white liberals who are, who are up there for a grand total of 44 hours. hours and half they, white liberals. Uh, that's true. <laughs> to be <laughs> being incredibly precise. B- before the uh, National Guard are called in to cleanse the place of these illegal immigrants and send them to the local military base. I have to say that what an amazing country this is, truly. Uh, <laughs> that, your, that your life story over the past eight weeks was tr- trekking the jungles of, of El Salvador <laughs> and eating raw mango and watching your friends die of disease. Mm-hmm. All the way up through Mexico, you finally make it to that border. The government you pay leaves off you MS-13, home. right? right. You pay off the cartel. Right. The, the, the coyotes smuggle you across the border in a truck. You you narrowly escape dying in Bexar County in the back of a of a hot truck, and then you are released as like a homeless person on the street, which is where apparently That's right. these these folks were found. Uh, and then you are flown to literally the richest area of the United States <laughs> on a charter flight, which is what most Americans. I mean. Maybe this should be actually our next Jeremy's Razors promo. Is that if you sell a lot of razors, we will put you on a charter flight to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Because that's pretty awesome. Where yeah. you can enrich the lives of so many. Of so many. And, uh, and, and so now they're they are suing Governor Yeah, but DeSantis. which progressive that lives on Martha's Vineyard is obviously funding that lawsuit? I mean, who do you think it is that's going to be behind it? Because they didn't come up with this idea all by themselves. Oh, no, obviously. no, no. There's a, there's a legal some... aid fund. It's a, it's a left-wing legal aid fund that is being funded of by, course. obviously. I just liked watching the guys on Martha's Vineyard quickly painting over there in this house we believe leave signs, you know. Yeah, the ones, <laughs> keep, out, keep out, we meant. Well, what they said was one of the uh, Martha Vineyard residents said that uh, after they deported them, you know, they took, the, they called the military and to deport them to a military base. <laughs> they said, we were, we were so happy they were here. We were so happy to help them on their journey. <laughs> so that, that's a good euphemism for deportation. Maybe we can start using that. Did you see what help NBC them on their journey back to Mexico. Did you see NBC News? They had to delete the tweet, but they didn't delete the article. They, yes. they said that Oh, there it is. There's the tweet. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis sending asylum seekers to Martha's Vineyard is like me taking my trash out oh, and driving to different areas where I live and just throwing my trash there. Oh, hey, did you hear gosh. what I called them? I called them trash. <laughs> like seven, seven times. That's what they believe. Just That's what they think of immigrants. A they foundation that helps them. refugees. That's how that person sees them. <laughs> right. my, my, my favorite guy was Ken Burns, though. I've, I've always, Ken Burns is always kind of stuck in my craw. He's always getting this kind of, oh, this brilliant, the documentarian, he's brilliant. So he's just done a documentary on America's role in the Holocaust, which, by the way, was basically zilch. I mean, we don't have control over everything. FDR didn't agree. What's that? FDR didn't agree. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but still. So he's done this thing, and it's getting brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. That's all it gets. He's on CNN, and a guy compares shipping these illegals to Martha's Vineyard to shipping Jews to Auschwitz. And Ken Burns nods and sort of picks up the idea and kind of goes with it. And I thought, a man that shallow 
is essentially two-dimensional, you know? I mean, no wonder he's working in film because film really only has two dimensions. And I, I this, guy, this guy should not be allowed to say anything. The words Holocaust should not be allowed to come out of his mouth after saying that. Because, I mean, you know, aside Don't from Don't you the, see the similarity? Yeah, well... They're well, exactly the, the same. <laughs> the guy, exactly. The, the golf courses are, are better on Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> but you didn't need them in Auschwitz. <laughs> yeah. Also, all the people in Martha's Vineyard did was also put them in buses and ship them away. Yeah. 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 That's and, what the federal government does. But when they do, the federal government does. That's right. The federal government leaves the border wide open, basically begging people to cross the Rio Grande and drown. How many migrants are dying every year yeah. of dehydration in the back of vans are, are dying, being washed away down the Rio Grande? And, and meanwhile, we're told that, that Joe Biden, he can't be bothered. You saw, you saw today that Joe Biden was asked about the fact that yeah. DeSantis has said that he's going to ship some illegal immigrants up to Rehoboth, Delaware. He's going to ship them up to, to Biden's vacation home, wherever it is. And Biden was like, well, you know, the, the weather's real nice here this time of year. It's like, well, I, I thought it was your job to take care of these people. I thought, I thought this was your job. That's right. Eric Adams had a pretty wild exchange on, on Jake Tapper where, where he was talking about how terrible it is. All these people are being shipped here and it's just so terrible and it's straining our social services system because when you ship 11,000 illegal immigrants since May to a city of 8.5 million people. That strains the social services system, mm -hmm. but it does not strain the social services system of Yuma, Arizona, population 97,000. <laughs> yeah. They have 100,000 people sent there every year. I do. That doesn't do anything. And then Eric Adams is asked by Tapper, so are you, would you say to Joe Biden that he needs to get control of the board? He's like, no, no, this is a humanitarian problem with a human cause. He's like, well, is that human Joe Biden? No, no, it's not Joe Biden. It has nothing to do, but the federal government should be left in charge of this issue. I, I will say, when, when you're explaining, you're losing. And the left has been explaining an awful lot on this particular I, I do, issue. I, I do have to say, I, I thought DeSantis, the guy's a boss. I just love the guy at this point. You know, I thought it was, it was one of the great political moves of all time. I do have a heart for these poor people. Of I, you know, I, I hate to say this because Shapiro will, will kill me about it for the weeks, but I have a heart for these poor people who are gotten involved in the fact that our po politics has collapsed into absurdity, you know? So, I mean, DeSantis is doing absolutely nothing that the federal government hasn't done. But at the same time, these people are being, you know, these poor, desperate people. I don't people have are being the same used. heart. What do no? you mean? I mean, they're, 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 yeah, opting, in, they're <laughs> opting into this. They're not going, I thought you know, it was nobody's Shapiro taking was them out. Yeah, like taking them out of these South American yeah. cities and forcing them to come to America and, and be dealt with like ping pong, political ping pong. It's like they're opting into this. No, so, but, I, but I'd opt into it. Is that what they're opting into? I would opt into it if I were them too. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, if part America is a place that calls forth the dispossessed, right? That's part of what we do. The, the problem isn't even that we have open borders. I mean, open borders is bad. Unsecured borders is bad. But America actually always has been incredibly pro-immigrant. The, the problem is that in the second half of the 20th century, the what? left did away with the idea of the melting pot. They did away with the idea that people well, need to assimilate into our... Yeah. Well, there almost wasn't a distinction, though, for many hundred... You know what? I'm, I'm the only one here that's married to an immigrant, right? No, yeah. No, and, and, I am. We're, we're, <laughs> oh, crap. And we're trying to deport him, too, <laughs> But by there's the a way. process, George, you know? Yeah. There's a process, and people don't realize how yes, long that process Thanks, takes. Of course. And exactly. so it's such an insult to just be like, well, you know, America is... But the no, main we reason... Like, we like legal immigration. But the main reason that we have all these processes is because we've actually destroyed the thing that made America able to be the most open country to immigrants in right. world history, which is the melting Small. pot... And individualism. Well, once you have once you have a welfare state and correct. multiculturalism, that's really the big one. Now you have to close down these borders. Well, I mean, it, it used to be that you left a place in Europe where you had you know whatever level of material well being you had to go to a place that was a literal wilderness and there was nothing really here. There wasn't a lot here. And even if you're talking like early 20th century, for you there really was still not a lot here. You were arriving here dirt poor, not knowing the language. So what that meant, and, and there was no welfare system. So the basic mm -hmm. idea was that maybe if you were lucky, you had some distant relatives who were here who would prop you up for a few months while you learned to stop speaking Yiddish and you started speaking English, which is exactly what happened with my relatives, you know, four generations ago and they came in 1907. But the, the basic idea was that we were drawing the best, the most entrepreneurial, the people who were the most risk-seeking to the United States. And there's still a lot of those people who I think want to get here. But when you have a welfare state and basically the idea is you get here and we are going to provide you all of these fulsome benefits, that's of right. course it changes the math. And that's not just in the and United the States, that's in why. Sweden. Why do you think a right-wing government just yes, took a yes. seat in Sweden? But why are we doing this? I think that's kind of a question that is on a lot of people's minds is why is America doing this? Because people keep saying like open borders, it's bad policy. No, it's actually good policy for the left. They're doing this intentionally. Also, you know, to I, today. We predicted that when they got power, the first thing they were going to do was try to flood a bunch of illegal immigrants over it. And they pretend that this was some wild 
old conspiracy theory and it wasn't actually true. Sounds um, like a great and now replacement theory to me. Uh, it, well, that, yeah, <laughs> You're exactly. going to get canceled for this that. Is <laughs> Whoa. But I've been saying it forever. They're, they want to replace black Americans, right? I think that what we're seeing and what has been shown is that obviously black Americans are the most impacted by this influx of illegal immigration. Um, and this was, by the way, policy work that was done under Obama to reveal that they were taking black American jobs. This is not a conspiracy theory. It was actually a congressional review um, that was done, a, a policy paper. Um, and when you talk about that, when you say, actually, I was saying this black America like crazy, as soon as they get power, we're, our vote is going to be irrelevant. Right. Because what they're going to want to do is they're going to suddenly say, which they have said this week, let's just give them all status immediately, yeah. right? Which means this is going to turn these people into voters. That's what they want. They're telling you what they want to do. And then again, that and then that black American vote, which is so significant for the left, it's not going to be that significant because they're going to turn to them like they did to black America in the 1960s, and they're going to offer them handouts. They're going to offer them welfareism. They're going to say, well, if you vote for us, what we're going to do is give you these handouts. And these evil, we're backwards Republicans don't want that for you. I mean, this is LBJ 2.0, the Great Society Act. You know, to, to that point, I mean, that's a, that's a really excellent point. And, but there, there is also this historical fact that for a lot of the early 20th century, we did kind of put a pause on immigration because there was so much and there wasn't enough assimilation. We had a major milestone today, which is that t- today, year to date, we've had 2 million border apprehensions in the United States. Apprehensions. Those are just the ones we got, okay? And it's only September, so we've got a quarter of the year left. That is an insane number. That, that's border apprehensions. Then you're, you're going to have another million legal immigrants. You're talking minimum three, three and a half. Six, seven hundred thousand gotaways. Yeah, exactly. And then, and so you're, when you look at the last six years of immigration, you were talking about the largest movement of people in recorded history. I don't think it, it takes a bigoted, awful, racist country no, to say, hey, maybe that's a lot of people that you're actively not assimilating, by the way, well, because the left is multicultural. I think the point about Sweden, though, is really well taken, because uh, they, they, this is the most successful left-wing socialist country. They were completely liberal because they were all the same. They all agreed on everything. They could all handle the welfare because they all had responsibilities to one another. Now they've let in all these uh, basically Muslim people. The crime has gone up. People are worried about this. They've elected really a right-wing government with with some ties to to neo-Nazis. And and the question, the thing that you always forget is that fascism is always a counter-revolution. Almost historically, fascism has always been a counter-revolution. So so it's... These are the actions you take that lead to fascism in reaction to what you do. I was doing. recently reading Neil Ferguson. No, no justification. Of, yeah, no, the, but an explanation. No, no, exactly. But it, it, it's a good. It's of course, a good but if, you, not if you're looking, if you're looking at history things. and you wish to prevent fascism, you should yeah. stop per, pursuing policies that lead to a reaction that is fascist in right. nature. You know, the, the, Neil Ferguson's book, the, the War of the World. I was recently reading that. It's his history of, of essentially global politics from 1905 to 1953, and he, he basically characterizes World War One and Two as part of the same long war. Um, and he says, when you're looking at global conflict, there's basically three major factors that lead to global conflict. One is declining empire, because when you have declining empire, then you have rising nation states, rising nation states. Empires tend to obliterate a lot of the ethnic distinctions that matter because you have a greater loyalty to, say, the Roman Empire than you do to your locality, or at the very least, they've delegated power down to the local level. And so when those are replaced by nation states, what you end up with is some nation states that are very homogenous in terms of composition and some that are very heterogeneous. And that's a real problem because then the slight majority in many of these states will start picking on the minorities in those particular states. So he says, <laughs> ethnic conflict, decline of empire, economic uncertainty. And I mean, when you look at, the, at the state of the world today yeah. and, and you look at the, what the, the defining factor is going to be whether the United States wishes to decline. If the United States wishes yep. to decline, there will be global conflict, period, end of story. Because the fact is, we are the only functional, quote-unquote, empire on planet Earth, whether we want to call ourselves that or not. And if we decline, somebody else is going to fill that vacuum. What fills that vacuum is not going to be particularly nice. Right, well, when, we're the, celebrating, but, when we start celebrating immorality and we refuse to acknowledge mental illness, which is, the, to me, the biggest issue in America today, we no yeah. longer call mental illness me- mental illness. We, in fact, we celebrate it. We encourage mental illness. And then we look at the end of the day and we say, well, I don't know why somebody walked into a school and shut off the school. Look at the culture. Look at American culture right now. We are in a state of degeneracy. And that is the truth. There, there's, there are degenerates everywhere. Um, and people don't like to use that word, but that's quite literally, I spelled <laughs> out the definition today on my show of what it means to be a degenerate. And that's what's happening in American society Did today. Did you name me? Hmm? That's not, I did. I, <laughs> I did nice. But and, and I wanted to comment on this earlier when we were talking about Queen Elizabeth, because something that really stood out to me was this contrast of 
all of these pundits coming out and saying, oh, well, people have a right to criticize her, right? Her history is complex, right? It's complicated. And they were willing to do that deep dive on someone like Queen Elizabeth, which we might agree with, right? But who were they not willing to do that for? The same people, and I checked their tweets because I wanted to cover it on my show, that said she's a complicated figure and let's go into her history, did not want to do that for George Floyd, mm -hmm. right? It was right. an act of racism or, to do that against George right. Floyd. Or you, or look we at couldn't, he was not a complicated pick, uh, person at all, according to them. In fact, one of them actually tweeted that he better get time person of the year, right? So Queen, when, when we're in a society where Queen Elizabeth is complicated and we, sh and we should not be celebrating her at all or honoring her life, rather, and George Floyd is not a complicated figure, yeah. we're in very bad times. No, time. this is Look legitimately enough to keep people up at night, unless, of course, you have a Helix mattress. <laughs> mm, well. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand, provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. So, how will you know which Helix mattress works best for your body? Take the Helix Sleep Quiz, of course. Find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Helix knows there is no better way to test out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. That is why your personalized mattress can be shipped straight to your door, free of charge, and they offer a 100-night risk-free trial. That's a really long time. Try out your new Helix mattress, see how your body adjusts, and if you decide that it is not the best fit, you're not gonna decide it. But if, if some, in some insane world that's what you thought, you're welcome to return it for a full refund. They will even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will love it. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress, picked by GQ and Wired Magazine, and it is recommended by multiple leading chiropractors as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. Helix is offering up to $350 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. So right now, if you want to kind of take a little trip into my boudoir, I don't know, go to helixsleep.com slash backstage. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last very long. With Helix, better sleep starts right now. That was such a good ad read until you got to that one line. <laughs> yeah. that, that was the turned trigger. off. Yeah, Everybody that started screaming viewership silently plummets. into the void. Yep. Speaking of boudoir, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about the new Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. Mm. <laughs> Is everybody watching the show? Yeah. Yes. I'm Absolutely one, not. one episode back. <laughs> I'm one I've episode back as well. I've seen them all, so okay, I won't guys, spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Can I just... For you yeah, two. We're not... Spoiler we're not, for both of you. Yeah, we're not waiting. Do it. <laughs> Do it. I want to hear it. I, I just don't know. This last episode, I just felt suddenly we got into woke territory. Like, there was just, like, the, the interracial relationship in, you know, England plus the gay couple plus. I was just like, okay, are, where are we going here? Is this going to be one episode? And, by the way, all of that backlash when they were saying, oh, it's racist because of this. It's like, no, it's just not realistic. I don't care if it's like watching a show that's supposed to be about Africa in 1820 and seeing, a, you know, a white person. You know, it's just, I just want shows to be realistic and suddenly it's not allowed anymore, I guess. Well, you know, that reminds me of uh, The Little Mermaid. <laughs> 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 oh, good, can I make that transition? Perfect okay. segue. The greatest thing that happened on the internet in 2022, yeah. Matt Walsh's so Little good. Mermaid commentary. Yeah. Explicate. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. we're talking about it. Good. Well, so for <laughs> it was a hard segue. But <laughs> I, I liked it. It, was just, it wasn't a segue. It was just like changing the subject. Uh, I mean, it's not like I had something important I wanted to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> for, for anyone who isn't familiar, so they've got this, uh, of course, they're, they're, the Disney films are going through and just remaking. They're doing the live action <laughs> version of every uh, cartoon, and so they're doing the uh, Little Mermaid, but it's with the Black Mermaid, who somehow still has uh, red hair, but they don't explain that. Mm -hmm. And so I happen to mention on my show, which is a scientific fact, that in, in reality, if there was a real mermaid living at the bottom of the ocean, because she does live at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> and we agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, because uh, <laughs> under the sea, some might. Under the <laughs> sea. I mean, she lives at the, at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, she has Let's a, be precise. Uh, right. Under the sea. Okay, right. Okay. Not a lot of sunlight, so... <laughs> What that tells me is that she would, she's not going to have dark skin. She's going to have, basically be translucent. You look at an, like an, one of these deep sea fish, mm -hmm. and this is yeah. the point I made on the show. They're, they're translucent. Possibly they're, bioluminescent. Right, right. Maybe they glow in the dark, but they're skeletal. One of those little lights. <laughs> They've got one of those things on the head. And it, should, it would be, it'd be, if you saw one, really, if you would want to marry it, like the, like the guy does in the film, uh, you would be, you'd be horrified. And so that's the point I tried to make. Yeah. A, a scientifically accurate. Right. Trans what bothered mermaid, you that, what translucent bothered? mermaids matter. Trans translucent mermaids matter. Right. I was advocating for translucent mermaids, and uh, Media, Media Matters, Matters takes it, <laughs> and they clip it, and they post it, and they accuse me of racism because I advocated for translucent rights. Basically, wow. they, basically, I'm a translucent supremacist, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, and then and the left just ran with it. And the great thing is that 
I, I did briefly try to explain that I was joking. I, I maybe said one tweet. This is their dumbest. Right. I, I sent one tweet, and I'm like, you know, that was a joke, guys. And, and all of them said, well, now you're backpedaling. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you think I wasn't Translucent joking mermaids. when I said the mermaid should be translucent? But you then after see, that, you realize. You should see her skeleton, you said. Uh, what I love about <laughs> what I love try reading the lyrics to WAP sometime. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's not be allowed 15, to joke. No it's, sense it's, it's of a humor. fifteen-minute comedy segment, and the left is like Ben Shapiro offended desperately by WAP. It's like this is, the, this is one of their games. They, they, they have many games. Man, one of their games is what we're doing is good, and if you notice, you're bad. And yeah. it's good that we're doing, but we're not doing it, but we are doing it. Right? <laughs> that's one of their favorite games. The other one is. You're joking, and we know that you're joking, but we're going to pretend you're not joking so that we can say that what right. you seriously mean is that there should only be a white little mermaid. That's why, and that's why you got to, I have I learned this lesson in the past, so I had to relearn it again uh, briefly, but it's, you have to just lean into it, which yeah, is why yeah. the next day on my show, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my show and do a 15-minute monologue advocating for a translucent mermaid, and so that's how I opened the show. I spent 15 minutes arguing for translucent mermaids because it's like, you know what? They're underrepresented. <laughs> by the way, right. I like No, but make... like underrepresentation, by the way, if we want to get into it, redheads. I couldn't believe this. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like redheads are actually the one mermaid that's a redhead. Like, I mean, I don't, I graduate with tons of black girls. I didn't graduate with any redheads. <laughs> Just want to say that. But there, there also is a, even though it's funny with the translucent stuff, there is a, a valid point to be made about the racial uh, representation and casting. And obviously there's an, a ridiculous double standard uh, we know that, you know, if you take a, 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 even a fictional character who is canonically black, change it to white, or even just, like, not black enough. I mean, they did the live-action version of, of uh, Aladdin, and some of the characters, they were all brown, but they weren't brown enough, a few of them. And that was a, that was a controversy. They did this with West Side Story. It was, right. some, of the, some of the actresses weren't Latina enough. They or were, they or, were or uh, most recently, James, James Franco playing Fidel Castro. And you've got uh, even Hispanic actors in Hollywood saying they're going to boycott it because even though actually James Franco and Fidel Castro actually share some... I, mean, I felt with I Hamilton, mean, they weren't black enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I, they could have been I mean, black enough. By the way, the, the, I mean, you're right in the sense... Look, I said this on the show. I mean, The Little Mermaid was written by Hans Christian Andersen. It is rooted in European mythology, right? It is. I mean, like, yeah, and if you did the same thing about an, a traditional African myth written by an African author, and then you made the character a blonde white lady... Same for I, House of Dragons. It's <laughs> rooted in giving you the ball. Knock it out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to say, though. I, he doesn't I want to talk about that. He wants I to actually do, the board. I actually do want to say something about Media Matters. Media Matters has made an art out of their fake news. I mean, they are truly fake news. Like, yeah. people always accuse us of two things, clickbaity headlines and fake news. Media Matters now, for the last two years, will take a clip of something we say. Yeah. They will excise the whole clip with context. Mm -hmm. The clip that they posted of you had the whole translucent joke in it. But then they write a clickbait headline, mm -hmm. which yeah. omits uh, all of the context. Ellipses are their best friend. Mm -hmm. This allows them to get a lot of clicks, saying something attributing to you a view that you don't even hold, start up the left-wing rage machine. They know that people won't watch the video and get the context. But they'll actually, because a video is linked, it adds credibility to the story. Yep. So all the left-wing blue checks who start hitting you, you're so stupid, you think that a fictional mermaid can't be black, which wasn't, the, wasn't even the point, I mean, you were making a joke. But every one of those people both didn't watch the clip and felt that the story must be credible because of the presence of a clip. Yep. And Media Matters continues the grift, which is a very profitable grift for us. Thank you, guys. Glad you're watching. <laughs> um, of clickbaits and fake news, and no one will ever hold and them. And it filters through. Yeah, it th filters through then the media because right. then you have the right. follow-up headlines. And I, I, I read a couple of them. It's always fun to read the stories, like telling the story of what you did and, and comparing it to what actually happened. Yep. So I'm reading some of these stories saying uh, Matt Walsh had a meltdown right. over <laughs> Black <laughs> Mermaids. A meltdown. I talked about it for two minutes. And <laughs> I threw a chair through a window. For, when have I ever had a meltdown about anything? First of all, had, I have no emotion. Have you been sincere? <laughs> Let's just say for a second, you were making an actual point about actual mermaids that you actually believe in. Okay, <laughs> which many blue checks accused you of. And which Michael believes in. And he told us just before the show. So started, listen, all I'm saying Columbus is, saw three all, all I'm saying, Christopher Columbus on his maiden voyage saw three mermaids. Oh there have been John Cook saw mermaids. There have been I. What race were they? Mermaids. Is the question. Would you, that, well, actually, Which probably black because they were probably manatees. But I'm just putting that aside for a second. Uh, all I want to point out is, believing in mermaids is way more reasonable than 
a lot of the stuff the libs believe in, including <laughs> transgenderism and the idea that the COVID vaccines yeah, prevent infection so and transmission. Can I say one thing about Disney and then we can get to your, your Game of Thrones thing? Yes. There, there is something fascinating about what Disney's new strategy is for marketing. Yeah. Because okay, what they have decided to do, and they're doing this in all of the remakes of their animated films, is they're taking IP that you know and identify from when you are a child. Yep. And they've decided that they are just going to troll the audience for headlines. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is you're not racist if you don't, if you paused for a second. If you saw the Little Mermaid trailer and you're like, wait, that doesn't look like Ariel from the animated movie. That looks very different. Mm -hmm. If you say that, that much, like, because uh, you're a racist, you're not colorblind, are you? Yeah. Right? They make a big deal out of casting somebody who does not look like Ariel. Listen, that was maybe the most popular movie in America in 1989 to 1999, between that and, and Beauty and the Beast. These were like the two most popular movies Absolutely. of everybody's childhood. The actresses in these movies, you would think, would look like the intellectual property in the movies, and then they changed it. And so the idea is that if you notice that, and you're like, oh, that's kind of strange. You're not even like, I'm, I'm against it, or I hate it. It's just like, that's doesn't look like, like what it would the movie be weird looked if Pocahontas like. was played by Elizabeth Warren. It would be objectively weird, right? And it's true. They do that because it's like what you always say. They want you to react, and then when you react, they call you a racist. Right. How would, why are you noticing? Why, why are you, you noticing? But even if you like, don't, because even it's it, weird. Even if you don't react, because before the whole translucent mermaid debacle, prior to that, actually nobody was actually no talking about the race no of, of the mermaid. In the Daily Beast, a day before, they had an article saying that race, I forget the exact phrase, but racists were... The racism, uh, the anti, the racist backlash against the Little Mermaid is out of control. They said the headline, and then I, because I, I read the article, how dare you? And, and I thought, okay, they're going to pull a few tweets of uh, people complaining about the Black Mermaid. Nothing. They they had zero examples of anyone even mentioning the race. Instead, what they cited were tweets of people complaining that the underwater scenes didn't look realistic enough. The CGI well, wasn't very good. And so, as the Daily Beast writer just editorializes and says, well. They're complaining about the CGI, but really, the, it's because they're racist. <laughs> what I want to know is why doesn't she have a seashell bra? Well, yeah. It's totally inappropriate. Yes. That Okay, that so the porn in Game of Thrones <laughs> is what I actually want to talk about. Hollywood, have you guys noticed, having seen all the episodes now, in the first episode and in the third episode, lots of nudity. I mean, that third or fourth, fourth episode, it's about as much nudity fourth as... Fourth episode is like hmm. 20 minutes of nudity. About as much nudity yeah. as you've ever seen in a show. Yes, I got a... In the with. episode, both <laughs> of the main female characters also have a sex scene. Right. Neither one yes, of them... I noticed that. Neither one of them is exposed. No. Neither... They're, hmm. they're naked but obscured. They're not... A, so Hollywood has determined in the Time's Up Me Too era... Huh. ...that they will know... So all the all the nudity is essentially non-speaking background actors. Yeah. Hollywood has decided wow. in the in the Me Too post Me Too era that they will no longer exploit actresses, except the ones that make two hundred dollars a except day. Except the ones that don't it's, have the power to stop them. It's yeah. unbelievable. Wow. They are it's they true. are actively only exploiting the actresses who have no power. Yeah, and I have to say, as someone who who loves a good nude scene, it did occur to me after a while that. Really, a woman should not have to take off her shirt to be an actress. It, you really should not. That shouldn't be a requirement. Hmm. Uh, you know? I mean, have, you seen yeah. that, have you seen that video? It's a very funny YouTube video of a, of a woman, and she's calling her parents. And she says, Mom, you know, I just got cast in this movie, and I'm going to be naked. I'm going to be having sex with two dudes on screen. The mother's horrified. And she's like, and it's on HBO. And mom's like, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, champagne. You know what was about this, though? Bye Bye Birdie. Have you ever yeah. Yeah. gone back and yep. watched the real Bye Bye Birdie? Yes. It's all about the fact, it's all about the corruption of America by show business. It's actually got a very serious point. This whole thing about we're going to be on Ed Sullivan, so I don't care if they use my daughter as a, as a sex object because we're going to be on Ed Sullivan. That <laughs> was kind of prophetic. Yeah. 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 Well, I will say that women do objectify themselves, and this has kind of been something that I've been being a drum about, and obviously we notably got into the discussion about our culture's desensitization, desensitization to porn. Like, my husband does not have social media. He's not on Instagram. He's not on even Twitter, but he says everything is porn. We just don't realize it. So yeah. when you open yeah. Instagram, it's just girls with their butts in your faces, their boobs in your faces, and it's these same women that will cry out and use the hashtag Me Too and Time's Up. And it's like, you want men to treat you with more respect than you treat yourselves. And I talked a little bit about on my show today, it's five days a week, can't tell <laughs> five days a week. Daily Wire Plus. Um, but you're seeing more and more of that where people somehow separate themselves, like their virtual character. It's almost like a game, like it's like an avatar. They're like, oh, well, it's totally fine that I'm online and I have my boobs out and my breasts out, but I really can't stand to see that men are objectifying women in society. We've lost respect for ourselves, and yet we think that we can then demand respect in other fields and in other categories. And I don't think it really works You like know what? That. I was just going back through, and I, I was turned on to this by Edmund Smirk, one of my favorite pseudonymous Twitter accounts. Mm -hmm. the, there was a clip of Catherine McKinnon, a radical feminist from 1993, yeah. and she's arguing with conservatives 
And she's saying, you guys are too weak on porn. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, if you were sitting in a room and you heard a, a lady get knocked around the walls in the other room, you would run out your door, you'd knock down, you might call the police. But because you're seeing it on a screen or you're reading it in a newspaper, or not a newspaper, in a magazine, it, you think it's totally fine. And it's this separation because it seems disembodied because we're living in this virtual That's world. That's right, the virtual but, world. But your virtual, the things you do in the virtual world have moral qualities as well. You're, you are still doing them, even if you're doing them in the quiet of your room with the light, blinds down. This is down. one of the big arguments against feminism from the left when it started out. Guys like Norman Mailer were saying they're going to bring back the Victorian, ultimately going to bring back the Victorian era. I remember even as a kid thinking, would that be bad, really? You know, is that, is that really a bad thing? Yeah. No, because, because of course, you're absolutely right about this. One of the things, one of the reasons the culture is in such a slump is because no one can define what a good man is. And it's almost impossible to define what a good man is if you can't define what a good woman is. That's and exactly if you define right. what a good woman is, you Or what violated. a woman is at all. No, 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 but, but certainly what a good one is, and if you define what a good woman is, you have violated a very, very uh, yes. central tenet of the law. I noticed that on Daily Wire when we did the live at the Ryman Center, a lot of the comments were, they really wanted us to kind of expand on the marriage discussion and what makes for a good marriage. Mm. And in going back to this idea of like what a good woman is, yeah. I was covering today, and it's it, it's rather innocuous, but Emma Rotajkowski is getting divorced, right? Mm. And she's sort of gloriously leaked to the press that it's because her husband um, has cheated on her, right? Mm. You know, Emma, Emily, is it Emily Rodzikowski? You know, she's naked all the time. I mean, for bizarre things. Like she's like, I'm protesting Brett Kavanaugh. My top's off. Why? <laughs> Nobody knows, right? Nobody knows. But we've seen her naked a million One times. One of my favorite she, actresses. <laughs> since she you love appeared her on the scene in Blurred Lines, Robin right. Thicke's video, which was just full pornography. And it's amazing to me that she, you know, calls him a dog or a not, somebody anonymous has said he's a complete dog and he cheated on her and she moved out. And I thought to myself, have you not been cheating on him? Like, is your virtual character <clears throat> somehow different? Yeah. Yeah. You are quite literally, would you do this in the real world, right? You're online, you've got your boobs out, you've got your butt out. Would you in the real world sit in a room full of men and put your boobs out and put your butt out? But there seems to be this mental detachment for women where they go, I know that I can be this tremendous act of infidelity in the universe of being online on Instagram and on Facebook is okay. It's not. Well, it's okay, but you cheated nude, on him and he cheated on you. I think on Ben Affleck's lap. I think you've cheated on your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, is, it is fairly incredible how self-centered a society we've become when the entire pornography industry, which of course is based on the male sex drive, the idea is that women will participate in this and then they will be offended that the male sex drive exists at the same time. So the idea is that just as when it comes to transgenderism, a person must be validated by you, right? My vision of myself must be validated by you. Now women will pose nude and if a man objectifies the nude woman, which is what men have done throughout human history when they see a nude woman, actually, uh, which was originally the purpose of nudity. Uh, when, when, that, uh, when, when that happens, then women get very offended. Ma the male sex drive? No, you're supposed to see me as I see me, liberated and free. And it's like, well, no, you're making money off the fact that the male sex drive exists, but then you're objecting to it existing because you wish that it existed in the way that you see the male sex drive, which is, which is utterly self-centered. It's not seeing yourself outside yourself at all. You're not, you're not like looking at, at who's, who's the actual client, who's the paying customer on the other end. It's just, I see my, I see my own freedom when I bear my breasts on TV. Right. But, it, but if a man objectifies me and he, and he sees me only as a sex object, then I'm, I'm, very, I'm very upset about there this. There is this, like, I mean, we were talking about this before, but there is this big strain of uh, reaction, even on the left, of women saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of miserable in this world. I'm kind of miserable treating myself and having other people yeah, treat me like this. And guys, you know, guys want to do things to me that I don't want them to do. And people tell me, well, now I'm not being sex positive. I mean, th there is this kind of, you know, it is, there's this terrible headline I keep seeing that, in spite of feminism, women are miserable. Of I course. Thinking, in what could be more enslaving than thinking that you have to take your clothes off to be heard? Like you could just comment on Brett Kavanaugh, but instead you have to take your top off because no one takes you seriously, and you know that. You don't take yourself seriously. And you are right that they do. It's all the jokes. 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 Yeah. Right, you've got the gal who is so obviously putting her breasts in in Michael's face, and then he doesn't look, yeah. but she wants him to look so bad she repudiates him anyway. My eyes are up here. That's the whole thing. There's a great video that was going around of of this woman. She's she's a conservative, and she was she's wearing a 1950s housewife outfit, and then she's also wearing like the 2022 blue-haired uh, MSNBC glasses outfit, and she's talking. It's supposed to be a conversation across time, and the 50s housewife is like, "So, how's the future? Are you are you doing well?" And she's like. 
yeah, everything's amazing over here. And the 50 house, like, so do you have any kids? She's like, no, I have no kids, but I have three cats. She's like, but you have an amazing boyfriend. She's like, no, I have no boyfriend, but I can have sex with whoever I want. She's like, that sounds terrible. Are you happy? She's like, well, I, I don't have kids. So I could take a magic pill that gets rid of the kids, or I could just abort the kids. And she's like, well, yeah, but but is this, in the end, is this making you feel more happy? She's like, well, I do have a pill that makes me happy. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, true. it's a sad satirical stab at the state of things today. So we're going to go to Members Block, which is the brand new thing we're doing here at Daily Wire for Daily Wire Plus members who make it possible for us to stay on the air. First, I always like to point out when our friends from Legacy Box come to see us because it's always the case, without fail, that they do not pay for an ad on the days that they come to watch <laughs> backstage. And I think that I think that it's a kind of manipulation. I think they know uh, he's going to say we're one of the longest uh, sponsors on the program and we're a great product. We preserve priceless we memories preserve that priceless will disappear memories. with time. Legacybox.com, there's probably a great discount right now. The best now. thing you can get for your parents. Yeah. yeah. It's, so, anyway. But we won't do it. No, I'm not no, going to do it this time. It. Uh -uh. Under no circumstances. <laughs> Head over to dailywireplus.com if you're watching on the YouTubes. Join us for Members Block by becoming a member. Hit that subscribe button uh, and and please contribute to our ability to continue to bring this great content. This great content. <laughs> 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 but you'll be able to ask us all kinds of questions. Who do we think is going to... Is Joe Biden actually running in the election? Will Jeremy actually say purple giraffes like the Daily Wire super fan chat, group chat wants him to? Th that's true. They were all in this little group chat saying, will he say pur purple giraffes, purple... I don't know what it means. <laughs> you won't do it. I'm not going to do it. No. Not, they're, they're no better than Legacy Box Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that subscribe button. Join us for Members Block, which is starting right now. And just like that, we're in the Members Block. Wow. That was, that was a bad.